Welcome to another episode of The Android Show. This is the show where we talk with the community about the latest and greatest in the world of Android development. I'm Nick. And I'm Anise. Today, we're bringing expert voices from all over the world, starting with one of my favorite Android experts, an amazing co-host, Anise Davis. You're making the complex, comprehensible at Android conferences and serving as VP of Engineering at Meetup. Thank you, Nick. And I'm so excited to be standing here in New York City. Today's show is all about our productivity as developers. The folks at Google even came up with a snappy theme for today. Faster and easier to build excellent apps across devices. Oh, you brought back one of my favorite drinking games. Cram the theme into the show. I think you mean thinking games. It's still a bit early. Fair point. Anyway, let's see who gets the highest score at the end. OK, let's do this. OK, so today, the show is going to be in three parts. First up, we'll be discussing developer productivity and how generative AI in Android Studio Bot helps make development faster and easier. Second, we'll cover how we're helping you build across devices, including wearables and large screens. And thirdly, we'll get into the development of excellent premium apps with Android 14 and a conversation with Dave Burke. Later in the show, we'll see some demos and hold a fireside chat with the Android team back in the Bay Area at the Googleplex. So don't forget, there's still time to send us your questions using hashtag AskAndroid or in the comments. And though we're not hosting an Android Dev Summit this year, we will be popping up at some of your favorite events around the world. Yep, we'll be at JoyCon in London next week and at DevFest throughout the rest of the year, where I'm sure AI will come up at least once or twice. Yeah, what do you think about AI? It seems to range from being a fad that's going to blow over to it's going to take over the world. <laughs> I don't think it's going to take over the world yet, but it did take over the really fun conversation that I had with Jamal on the Android team. We talked about some of the work behind the AI-powered studio bot and where it's going. Check it out. Generative AI can help transform the way teams and people work, and this includes app development. This year at Google I.O., one of the most exciting announcements was StudioBot, the AI-powered coding assistant built into Android Studio. I wanted to chat with Jamal Eason to learn more about it. Can you start telling me a little bit more about the idea behind StudioBot? Yeah, you know, we've been thinking about AI and ML for some time, but really, you know, up until late last year, we had a great model developed in partnership with Google Research and ourselves focused on app development. And so we first thought about focusing on code completion. We decided to pivot to a conversational bot so that developers have control of the conversation. And with that, it was the birth of StudioBot. Well, I was eager to test it out, and I've used it several times since launch. I think this is a great step in the right direction for Android development. However, it still feels a bit experimental. Can you tell me more about where Studio Bot is heading? Thank you for trying it out. It's definitely an experiment, and we want open feedback about this progress. Our main focus in our future direction is about quality and responses. We know that you want to be able to trust the response and it would be more productive than using StudioBot. Adding real-time information is important to a large image model, so we actually added the Android documentation as a supplement resource to StudioBot responses, which leads to higher fidelity and responses. How is StudioBot really any different from the other things like ChatGPT? Good question. So as you know, Android Studio is an IDE, so we have the full context of your coding experience while you're developing. So instead of relying on an external window or some sort of external context of an LLM, we can answer responses in the context of your source code. So if you have questions about your API calls or some errors, we have that sort of context while building your app. So I saw you just opened StudioBot in over 170 countries. Yes, the main feedback we heard from developers is that it was only in the US. So now it's international, so more developers can participate in the preview. And you said you have some news for us? Yes, today we're releasing code completion. So what's different about the code completion that's available today, instead of doing one-line code completions, you can do multi-line code completions, you can get suggestions on how to do comments for your code, or how to add documentation to your code. All these things are making more productive and developing and coding with Android. That sounds like it would be really helpful. And it's great to hear that StudioBot is going to do a much better job at answering my questions. But for the elephant in the room, do I need to share my code with StudioBot? So by default, Studio does not share your source code. We only have the conversational history that's shared between you and the bot. 
Going forward with the conversational agent expanding to code completion, we're now adding a custom way for you to opt in to what's shared with Studiobot, specifically adding a new .ai file. What are you most excited about with respect to how generative AI can help app development? I think the big thing for AI development is making sure developers can spend time on the things that are most needed for the development of apps. So think about the creation part, the architecture part, less about the boilerplate part. So freeing up your time from those cycles, you can make more productive and more amazing apps for devices in the ecosystem. Awesome. It was really great chatting with you, Jamal. And we're live. Hello from Google Complex in California. Jetpack Compose gives you powerful and expressive APIs, making it faster and easier. Ding, ding. <laughs> we're going to win this, right? <laughs> making it faster and easier to build beautiful UIs, either in new apps or in new screens in your existing apps. As we continue to add new APIs, we're also focused on making Compose as performant as possible out of the box. In the latest release, we've landed 80% improvement in composition time for modifiers, 22% uh, improvements for text, and memory usage reductions. But don't take my word for it. Let me show you. So this is JetChat, one of our Compose sample apps. We've written a benchmark test to see how long it takes to produce each frame when we're scrolling through the conversation screen. So if I run this test, um, it's going to output the results, the test results here. But I'm not going to wait around for all of these 10 iterations of scrolling the, the screen. Um, so. What I'm going to do is uh, use the results from a benchmarks that I took using the June uh, release. So this is before we actually did the, the performance improvements. And I pasted these results in this tool. This is a tool that's developed by the community. It's called Benchart, and it's available on, uh, on GitHub. So and with this tool, I can actually vis uh, visualize the timings. What's more, I can also compare timings. So here I can paste the results um, of the benchmark test using the latest BOM version. So if I scroll here, I see that for my scroll test, I got three to five milliseconds improvements. So I got these improvements just by updating Compose to the latest version. I didn't have to do any other code changes. Awesome. And while we're talking about how we're making Compose faster, what about how you automate tests for your Compose UI? We think that should be faster too. So we know developers love using previews because it allows you to manually validate different parts of your app's UI across different form factors and themes, all without having to deploy to a real device. What if we could use that awesome technology to provide fast host side screenshot tests using the previews you already have in your project. Well, with a couple of steps, let me show you how. Here I have the Now an Android app, which has a number of previews. This one here has a multi-preview that tests across different themes. Now, if I wanted to start using or convert these to screenshot tests, believe it or not, I just need to run a single task. This is the preview screenshot update task. So I run this, and what Gradle is doing is it's going through all the previews in this module, rendering them and taking screenshots. And as you can see, they start filling up here. And in just about 10 seconds, it's done. That's pretty great. And so what if I made a change here where I changed the color of this check mark to a slightly different color? I can't quite tell the difference. Can you? I can't either. Well, let's see if the screenshot test can figure it out. So then what we do is just we run the preview screenshot test. So it's not up an update. And so what happens here is Gradle will go through and compare the previous reference screenshots that we took earlier to what they look like now. And so we expect this build to actually fail in just a moment, and there it is, with some HTML test results. So let's load that up. 
And as we can see, the class that I did change has failed. We click into here and we can see exactly where the pixels are different uh, before compared to now. And so the, all these tests run in the JVM. So they'll run super fast. Um, we expect to roll this out this year specifically as an AGP plugin so you can start using it in your continuous integration builds and provide us feedback and expect full integration into the Android Studio so you can review and manage your screenshot tests all from the IDE. And there's more we've been doing to help you build faster and easier for Android. For Kotlin builds, you can now use the K2 compiler in beta to give you a speed of, of builds. We also added the trace for app startup in uh, Perfetto. Uh, what else did we do? Uh, we've, <laughs> we've also added the Kotlin multi-platform uh, support in paging. We've added KSP support for Dagger and Hilt, also in alpha, and more. But I think this is it from us. I'm going to hand over to the Threads team to see how they were able to, uh, to build and ship an excellent app using Compose. My name is Richard. I'm a software engineer on Threads. I'm passionate about user experiences, and I've been building UI on Android for about 11 years now. Threads is a new text-based conversation app built by the Instagram team, where communities can come together to talk about everything from the topics they care about today to what will be trending tomorrow. Over 90% of our UI is built in Compose. Threads is built on top of the Instagram code base, where we've been using standard views for a long time. We wanted to build our new app from scratch with Compose because we thought it would enable us to move faster than refactoring our existing large application. We built and shipped Threads in five months, and this exceeded our speed expectations for how quickly we could build an app of this quality and at this scale. And a lot of the team was actually new to Compose when we started building this, but they found it really easy to get started, and they had a lot of fun using Compose. Compose provides all-encompassing modern APIs that ship with the app, and this let us spend less time worrying about backwards compatibility or missing features or differing functionality between different versions of Android. Because Compose code ships with the app, we can also step through our system UI code while we're debugging our app, which is super helpful. Compose's design encourages a modular and plugin approach to development. One example is modifiers. Modifiers provide all sorts of functionality that are inherently reusable. We made our own custom modifiers for things like our custom click behaviors and our threadline illustrations. This allows us to apply our branding and use the correct layouts throughout the app and move things around while we were iterating on what the design of the app should be. Compose has reached the point where it does pretty much everything we needed to, but it was easy to interoperate with views as necessary. And we did that in a couple of places. One was with our videos, and the other one was the media picker in our composer. We made sure that threads would resize properly on large screens and foldables. And I think the way Compose is designed actually made it really easy for threads to just work through these types of configuration changes. I think people who have been doing standard view development for a long time will be pleasantly surprised with the simplicity and elegance of solutions that are built in Compose. Whenever I come across a view or an XML-based layout, I kind of get like a visceral reaction, and it just makes you want to just go back to the Compose code. Jetpack Compose has been really fun to use, and we're really excited for future developments from the Android team. At the scale of Meta's apps, even a small performance improvement can have a measurable impact on engagement and even revenue. Given the positive results we've seen in Threads so far, we're really excited to continue adopting Compose in the main Instagram app. For developers who are building new apps, I would definitely recommend using Compose. Not only is it enjoyable to use, but I think it would set your team up for success in the future. You look different. Wait, so do you. Where are we? I think we're in the new Android world. Hey, I'm pretty cute. I like this look. Yeah, these are fun. So, I guess we should continue the show? I guess so. Okay, well, that's your line then. 
Oh, cool. Even the camera operator is a bug droid too. All right. Now, we're moving from building faster and easier to building across devices. Coming up, we'll be stepping into the world of wearables, foldables, and large screens, including demos with the team. But first, Nick got to go to the Made by Google event earlier this month and talk with the team about the new Pixel Watch 2 that just came out. Let's take a look. Earlier this month, I went to the Made by Google event where the team unveiled the next generation wearable, the Google Pixel Watch 2. There I chatted with Ryan and Jamie from the team about the brand new device, as well as the latest update to Wear OS and what they're excited for developers to build for it. I started by asking Ryan to walk me through what's new in the Pixel Watch 2. Here at the demo mode, we have Pixel Watch 2 with Wear OS 4, which is our most capable and customizable device yet. If you look at the back, we have a new sensor array okay. that allows us to do multi-path optics. We have a temperature sensor as well as an EDA sensor and an all-new heart rate sensor for multi-path optics that bring an increased heart rate performance of over 40%. As well as improved processor, we have a revamped Fitbit UI here, mm -hmm. leveraging the best that Fitbit has to offer for health and wellness experiences. Pixel Watch 2 takes it to the next level, leveraging that same iconic design, now with 100% recycled aluminum. So we're launching 60 watch faces, all new complication types. You can go really dense, up to eight complications on one clock face, depending on your setup. We also have a all new crown, which is easier to use and more flush with the device. Now is a great time to get started. Wear OS 4 gives developers several options for building great wrist experiences, from watch faces and complications to tiles and apps. And starting today, there's a developer preview that's available so you can optimize your apps for Wear OS 4 while you're pre-ordering your Pixel Watch 2. We are really interested on how we can extend the helpfulness of Google and bring it to your wrist. And developers are part of that story, just as they always have been. Pixel Watch 2 has really been a deep collaboration, bringing the best of Google and Fitbit together. So I'm really excited about the advancements and complications. So you can build richer watch faces and take advantage of the round glass display of the Pixel Watch 2. With new algorithms and AI, new hardware, and new software, we're really taking a major leap forward in the smartwatch market. You can get started by going to developer.android.com slash wear, where there are tools, APIs, and guidance. From there, you can get access to the developer preview. There are code labs for Wear on Compose. And you can get design inspiration from the Wear OS gallery. That's a snapshot of my time seeing the Pixel Watch 2. But we've built an entire gallery on developer.android.com to help you get inspired. Be sure to check it out for mockups, guidance, and more. Wow, I am so excited for the new Pixel Watch. We want to make it fast and easy for you to build across the broad range of Android devices. To help, we provide Compose as a familiar, productive programming model adapted to each unique screen size and form factor. TJ and I are now going to show you how we're making it easy to build for Wear OS and large screens, like foldables. Few form factors excite me as much as foldable devices. However, not everyone has access to one. Let's see if we can change that. If I pop over here to Android Studio and I look in the tool window, something special here, something new. You see there's this expandable tab says remote. Let's go into that. <laughs> look at that. I've got a wide range of devices to pick from. And look at that. Some of them even have a little Firebase icon. This is device streaming from Firebase, and it gives you access to physical devices over a secure ADB connection to see what we can do with it. Um, so here in, the in Android Studio, I'm going to go over here. And this device I have in front of you is actually a physical pixel fold. Well, how do I know that it's a pixel fold? Let's do some cool things with it. I'm going to try and open this up here. I'm going to open it. Look at that. I've got my pixel fold all the way open. And now that it's open, I can do things like rotate it to the left, rotate it, rotate it to the right, pretty much just verify and run all my test cases I want on my app on here. Device streaming is free to use while it's in preview, so please give it a go today. OK. Apart from device streaming, I want to show you something else that's uh, Finger flicking good, as we say. Um, I'm going to go here into the Now in Android app. And look, there's a bookmark here. And look at that. It has been a whole year since we launched our very first Pixel Watch. I think this is an article I want to send over to John. 
Pixel Watch? Yeah, send it over. <laughs> All right. Um, in Compose 1.6.0, we added support for drag and drop. I'm going to show you how to do this over here. Now, if I go into now and Android again, and I just move this over a little bit, here I have a news resource card, and it's got a, uh, it's got a modifier. The modifier describes how things work in Compose. For drag and drop, what I want to do is add a drag and drop source modifier. So let's go ahead and do that. So not D. I put that in. Within that, I have a lambda. And in that lambda, I have access to a pointer input scope. The pointer input scope, like the name suggests, lets me track things that are going on with the pointers, fingers, finger flicking. Um, here, I want to start dragging and dropping after a long press. So let me go ahead and do that. Do a long press. Lovely. And then once I've detected the long press, I actually then want to start the drag and drop transfer. So I'm going to do a start transfer. And then, because again, this is some text that I want to send over to John, I'm going to create a clip data that's got text as the MIME type. So I'm going to do a text clip over here. Lovely. OK, let's run this and see if I can get it over to John. While that's building, I just want to show you something else that's cool. Again, the device streaming, this is a physical device. So I can go into the log cat, go into the pixel fold right here. And like I can see all the logs and everything else I want to do. I could also attach my debugger if I wanted to. So while this is building, oh boy, it's a lot of stuff going on there. OK, <laughs> now we're in build. Fantastic. I'm just going to save right here. And I want to send an email over to John. So I'm just going to bring this up, bring Gmail up here. Put it side by side. I'm going to start composing. Oh, actually, is this is a bit small. I'll make it a little bigger for you. All right. I'm going to start composing an email to John, who's, look at that. His profile photo is a giraffe because, I mean, <laughs> of course it is. Um, I'm going to put it over here to John. I'm going to say subjects. I'm going to say check this out. All right. I'm going to minimize this. I'm going to grab the card, drag it. Ooh, look at that. It's a little ghost. Spooky season. It's October. <laughs> uh, I'm going to put it over here, put it right over the cursor, drop it. And look at that. Now I can send this email all the way over to John. Now that I'm done with the device and I've sent my email to John, I want to make sure that I go back in the device streaming window. I want to go here, and then I want to return and erase the device. By doing that, it makes sure that before the same device is available for someone else to use with device streaming, it is wiped, and everything that I have on there is gone, and the next person can use it. OK, that's it for drag and drop and compose. I'm going to send this over to John to tell me some possible cool things about Wear OS. Let's take a look at how TJ's message will look in my new messaging app. Here we can see the new Wherefore emulator running in Android Studio Giraffe with the newest features for Wear OS Compose 1.2. One of my favorite additions here is the new Swipe to Reveal feature, which lets you add up to two secondary actions when swiped to the left. This would go great in my new app as a way to triage TJ's message. So let's implement Swipe to Reveal. and move the composable up into the primary content and build it. Here we can see that I've added a primary swipe action, an additional action, which developers can customize, and an undo button, which is generally a good idea. I think so. And look at that. It's up. And we can see that if I swipe to the left, I can see all my triage options for TJ's message. All right, let's move on to expandables. The new expandable components provide an easy way to fold and unfold content on demand. This is perfect for reading the long message that TJ just sent me. So let's implement it. A UI that implements an expandable component will need an expandable item, as seen here, and an expandable button to trigger the expansion. Of course, expandables are stateful, so I will need the expandable state. And if I pass that into the expandable item, like so, and then into the expandable button, these two composables will work correctly. And if I build my app, I should be able to open TJ's long message, <laughs> press show more, and I'll see everything he wrote for me. All right, a little prayer to the demo gods. Oh, yeah. Here we go. I knew it would work. <laughs> so here's TJ's message. And if I click Show More, I get to see everything you wrote for me. See? I knew you'd love it. <laughs> Thank you.
All right, but you did have to run it and build it uh, for it to show up. Is there a way you could actually do that without actually having to build the app? Mm, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> There's actually a new Compose preview annotation that we can add to the sample to see exactly how the UI will look in real time. So I'll just add those here, where preview devices and where preview font scales. And if I minimize the emulator and open split screen, I can see that Android Studio will show me exactly how my UI will look across all different form factors and font scales. Lovely. And that's how Compose is helping you, us and developers build apps from all, across all form factors, big, small, and everything else in between. And now I'm going to hand it over to Zoom, and they're going to show us the cool stuff they're doing with tablets. <laughs> Zoom is an all-in-one collaboration platform where we bring people together through Zoom meetings, Zoom team chat, Zoom phone, AI companion, and more. I'm Will Chan. I'm a product manager on Zoom meetings. Over the past few years, we've seen Zoom bring people close together, and that's what excites me most about my job. Zoom wants to make sure we make the best user experience for all our users, and we are excited to see the investments being made in improving the experience for larger screens on Android devices. So users who leverage both their phone and their tablet are spending about 62% more time on their tablet. So Zoom tablet users engage about two times more than phone users. And so we decided that we would scale our UI from mobile phones to larger screens to make sure that we support things like split screen or you know, foldable. And so we definitely want to continue making sure that we invest in making that experience as good as it can be. We use Jetpack Window Manager and Constraint Layout. Window Manager allows us to change the UI in tabletop mode so that the video can be on the top and the controls are on the bottom. And with Constraint Layout, we use that to simplify our layout logic, reducing a lot of the complexity that we have today, and be able to increase the performance and uh, create a better UI for our users. So with Foldables, we focused on tabletop mode, and we wanted to give users an ability to have a hands-free experience when using Zoom. And then additionally, for other optimizations we made in Team Chat, you can have a split-screen view, so users can see their previews of the chat on the left-hand side, and then the details of all the chats on the right, making better use of the space with a larger screen. With multi-window support, we allow users to go into picture-in-picture -in -picture mode, so they can multitask and go use other apps while staying in their meeting. We also allow users to resize windows and have the UI scale accordingly. So we use a resizable emulator in Android Studio to check how our experience would look like across many different devices and across different kinds of foldables and tablets. It made developing and testing a lot easier and make sure that our experience is great on multiple large screen devices. So we're most excited about the global reach of Android and our engineering team appreciates all the investments being made in the Jetpack libraries and has made their lives much easier in developing things like foldables and Android Auto for the platform. I'm also really excited about the future of you know, work and collaboration with hybrid work, with artificial intelligence and how we can make people more productive. Foldables are one of the newest form factors for Android and users more broadly, but we're already seeing some amazing hardware coming from our partners. The combination of a large unfolding screen and mobile device-like portability offers unique experiences that developers are starting to embrace. For instance, Zoom is utilizing tabletop mode and Concepts has integrated stylus support. I recently spoke with Raj from Samsung, a pioneer in foldable technology. I started by asking why developers should embrace large screens like foldables and tablets. Now that you're in the fifth generation of the Galaxy foldables, why have you continued to invest in the foldable space? Foldables are growing fast. And as we shared in the Unpack, some of the researchers have shown that in the next couple of years, we will hit 100 million shipments per year. Half of our users want to change to foldables. So that's really exciting for us that we have been creating this new category of devices for our Android users. That's so exciting. How would you encourage developers to get started designing for foldables? The app has to be responsive. Uh, it needs to support multi-instance, multitasking. And uh, I would also encourage the developers to think about uh, supporting the S Pen so that the creativity is taken to the next level on these devices. Yeah, and I feel like we as Samsung and Android have collaborated so much to provide many tools for developers. Earlier this summer, Samsung hosted their Galaxy Unpacked event, where they introduced their latest foldables like the Galaxy Z Fold 5 and the Z Flip 5. 
Raj, what were some of the coolest features packed into these new phones that developers should care about? For the flip side, people love our flex cam and the cover screen uh, is great for customization. For the full five, uh, I think it's a powerhouse productivity device. It's like a PC in your pocket. Multitasking is, a, is definitely a key. We have seen uh, users equally using the cover screen and the unfolded screen. App continuity is a very important thing when you go from the outer screen to inner screen. So I encourage developers to make sure like their app is ready for the app continuity. Next, I spoke with Raj about the tools and resources that Google and Samsung offer for developers to get started. So whenever we release uh, uh, these form factor devices, we are immediately making the skins available for Android Studio so that the developers can download them and test their apps on these uh, skins. And also we have the remote test lab where developers can go and uh, test the applications on the real devices and hash out any quality issues they have. And these are great resources. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Raj. If you're an app developer and you'd like to get started, go to developer.android.com for all the resources. That Samsung discussion was really nice. It was so eventful. I'm going to rewatch it on my Android 14 power device. I'm going to rewatch it on my foldable screen. We really are a dream team. <laughs> I'm like anything anyone has ever seen. Nick, are you actually going to challenge me to a rhyme off? Uh, yes, and I'm going to let you kick it off. Gene. Jelly bean. Meme. Machine. Green. Ah, I can't think of a rhyme. Oh, I'm so sorry, Nick. I'm sure you'll get it next time. All right. Welcome to the show, Dave. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so Android 14 started rolling out to users this month. But before we start, at IO, you gave a great demo of some of the generative AI wallpaper functionalities that's now available. So we wanted to know, what is your current wallpaper? Uh, I'm right on message because I actually have a generative wallpaper. Uh, the one I currently have is, um, I can't remember the exact prompt, but it was something about a surreal bike. And uh, you probably can't see it on the camera too easily, but it's generated this like really funky bike with um, uh, gravel handlebars. If you have a road bike and you have gravel and it's a gravel bike, they're, they're angled out. And somehow the AI has decided to create me this like fixed gear gravel bike that's kind of awesome and it makes me feel very cool so i have it on there um but actually the you know the work that went in from google io in the summer to now it from a machine learning point of view it's just been pretty amazing like the quality of the new diffusion diffusion models that we're using to power this are just really have got awesome and the aesthetic is beautiful and so i've just been having a lot of fun creating different wallpapers so so obviously gen ai has definitely been one of you know a big area of investment for us and android and I kind of wanted to know from your perspective, what are the, some of the other big areas of investment that we've seen in Android 14? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the Gen AI falls into the category I would call expression. So there was like a set of things in there, you know, you know the, so the generative AI wallpaper is one, but things like custom clocks, which is what a lot of our users were asking for. Um, and I'm using some of the new ones that are in the beta uh, right now. Um, there's, uh, you know, customized shortcuts, uh, even things like uh, expressing yourself through images with Ultra HDR is another interesting one. Let's see, we, we have a bunch of uh, accessibility features, so it's sort of low vision and hard of hearing. So we've got a much better magnifier now. Uh, it's got more customized options. It's more powerful. We have um, flash notifications. Uh, you can configure your, your, your camera flash or your screen itself to flash if you get a notification. So I think these are, these are features that, you know, if you are low vision or hard of hearing, they they make a massive difference to your everyday life, and so um, and so it's just really important to us that, that we deliver features for everybody. So you've been speaking a lot about how the team has been working pretty hard on improving the Android performance and experience in fourteen, um, and so you know the team has been focusing a lot on quality. So can you tell us why why does this matter? 
One of the things that we did internally is we made a pledge to ourselves that we would make ensure that every release was higher quality than the previous release by a set of expanding metrics that we measure in the lab and in the field. Um, and we've been holding ourselves to that. And uh, and it's difficult, I can tell you, because you know, you're know you only as good as the weakest metric. And so you've got to chase everything down. But it's really causing us to like force the bar higher and higher. What type of experiences are you excited for Android developers to start like building in the next year? Is there anything that you would be like you would like them to uh, be doing or you know a different technologies you want them to be playing with or you think that Android can help them build I I think there's a, a really great opportunity for Android to differentiate with foldable devices um, and uh, you know I use them all I, I just can't give up the foldable device I just love this I can just sit down, unfold, and like read a full size a paper, full size. It's just like awesome, um, and uh, and so I think uh, what you'll see from us is it wasn't just like hey we got a surge and catch up and now we just sort of go back to business as usual. There's just we have a whole roadmap for large screen, um, and it's just going to get better and better and more productivity focused, etc. And so I'm pretty pretty excited about that. But I would. You know, I uh, I would I would encourage developers definitely look at that, um, and I think the foldable devices themselves are just going from they're going to get just get even better and better. I've seen prototypes of new th- new hardware um, from all sorts of manufacturers around the world, and it's it's really nice. Well, Dave, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Android Show. Thank you. It was uh, it was a lot of fun talking. Great. <laughs> So we've just heard about some of the exciting new features in Android 14, and we want to show you how you can use these features in your apps. But first, you actually have to update to Android 14 within your apps, and the SDK Upgrade Assistant is here to help you. All right, so I'm going to go to Tools, Android SDK Upgrade Assistant. I see a list of migration paths. I'll select the Android 13 to Android 14 migration path. I see some options that I should be mindful of while I migrate. Uh, In particular, let's pay attention to the foreground service types are required because there's an action I can take. Uh, Apparently, there's an error here in my Android manifest. I'll click that. The SDK Upgrade Assistant opens up my Android manifest for me, shows me where I need to make this change. Uh, In this case, I need to specify a foreground service type. So I'll go ahead and do that and press re-verify and see that that code path was resolved. So hopefully the SDK Upgrade Assistant can help you migrate. And now I'm going to open up this. Uh, And close this. Open up that. Go ahead and run this. And yes. Is it showing? No, I don't think so. We connect. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So let's talk about widgets. Some users love widgets because it enables them to quickly complete a task right on their home screen or get information at a glance. Jetpack Glance uses Jetpack Compose for quick widget development. Uh, here are some new things you should know about Glance. It's now stable. It supports recomposition so that you can update the widget easily, and it supports dynamic color. And supporting dynamic color is so much easier now, too. So let me show you. Uh, I have this demo widget on the home screen. This allows me to plot river otter locations. For this demo, it's random locations. I'm pressing this button here, and nothing is happening, and the button looks bad. So let's get this widget working. Yes, so first we'll want to recompose the button to show a new location after she actually presses it. So you'll see Ash here, she's typing in datastore.addMarker, which gets passed down to the button. And every single time now the button is pressed, there should be a recomposition. For dynamic color, we're going to use a glance theme. And so we're going to change the choke in to something like primary container, which will change the button's background dynamically based off of what the wallpaper looks like. So, with these changes, let's see what the widget looks like now. Okay, 
It's building. And it's building, and it's compiling, <laughs> and it's finished, and it's installing, and there we go. <laughs> All right. OK, widget has updated. Uh, so let's say I spot an otter. I will press this button. The widget recomposes to show me that new location. Every time I press the, bu the button, the widget is recomposing. Uh, we didn't show this in the code, but every time I resize, the widget recomposes to show me a map of the correct size. And with that, we've seen how recomposition hopefully makes it easier for you to keep uh, your UI up to date as your user interacts with it. Uh, for dynamic color, we saw that the button background has changed and it harmonizes with the wallpaper. So there it changed again. So with that, we've seen how Glance supports recomposition and dynamic color. We're excited to see the widgets you'll make. Over to Mozart to learn about Ultra HDR. Yes, Ultra HDR is Google's new backwards compatible image format that improves dynamic range and colors in your images and makes them pop on your screen. Showing Ultra HDR over live stream is not possible, but hopefully this video that will pop up will give you a sense of the quality improvements you'll see when displaying Ultra HDR images. Yes, so like on the left, you'll see the base SDR image and in the middle, a gain map. These two combined together create the final Ultra HDR image. And you'll notice in this particular example, there's much brighter highlights in the clouds and in the lights that you see. So, Let's see how you can actually display Ultra HDR images in your apps. So there is two main ways to activate HDR mode, which is what helps you display Ultra HDR images. Uh, the first way is you can do this. You can opt in an entire activity into HDR mode by doing something like this. You go in and you'll set the color mode tag to HDR. Now, this will work and activate HDR for that entire activity. But what we really recommend you do is to do this at runtime, to detect if an Ultra HDR image is about to be displayed and then activate Ultra HDR mode. So how do you do this? Let's jump in to this. We're using Glide right now. And Glide provides this ability to intercept a bitmap before it's set on an image container. And so what we'll want to do is check if the bitmap has a gain map. To do this, we will run a little bit of code that will check if the bitmap has a game map, simple API, returns true or false. And then based off of that, we will either activate color mode HDR and or we will activate just default in SDR mode. And so Ash, what do you think happens if you get an ultra HDR image but you don't do this? Yeah, so if we don't opt in but we get an ultra HDR image, we should just get an SDR JPEG image instead. Yeah. Exactly, and it will, it will act as normal as if nothing happens. Your app won't even notice the difference. And so we hope that you end up opting in your apps to show beautiful HDR images. So now, let's hear from Snap and how they use Camera 2 extensions to improve Snapchat. Snapchat is a viral communication app that allows our community to express themselves, live in the moment, and learn about the world around them. I'm Ye Tian. I'm a software engineer on the camera team at Snapchat. Snap constantly makes camera improvement. We understand that many OEM differentiate their device by their camera. This is where night mode comes in. We collaborated with Google and implemented night mode via Camera 2 extension API on Pixel devices and later added type to focus and zoom features. The Camera 2 extension API is flexible and complete. Snapchat can use it to build full-fledged application on demand without negatively impacting app performance and stability. Camera 2 extension API enables us to integrate features 50% faster than typical industry approaches in the past. Before the recent improvement, Snapchatter had trouble capturing high-quality snaps in a low-light environment. The result snap is either too dark or too blurry. Our collaboration with Google on the Camera 2 extension API paved the way for our collaboration with other OEMs to implement night mode with minimal code changes. 
The implementation via Camera 2 Extension API make it very easy for us to add more camera features into Snapchat app, like preview stabilization. Night mode is well received by Snapchatters. The addition of tap to focus and zoom features further boosted the usage of night mode. Snapchat Android app was initially designed to be portrait only, running on a traditional mobile phone. Over the past few years, we updated the app to support large screen devices on Android. That includes multi-window support as well as Chrome OS support. In order to handle different challenges, like the user rotation, the horizontally placed camera sensor, the landscape display mode, and all the possible combinations that could be present in large screen devices, we had to change some of our fundamental assumptions in our original app design. We also found the Google Developer Guide on large screen support to be extremely helpful with plenty of examples on diagrams and the code to explain the problems and solutions. If you are a developer wishing to make camera improvement, I would definitely recommend you to use Camera 2 Extension API that provides extensive functionalities and stable performance. I enjoy to bring the cutting-edge innovations into the Snapchat app so that Snapchatters can capture their life moments and share their joys. <laughs> and welcome back to the Googleplex for the Android Fireside Chat. Caught me doing a selfie there. Um, so this is your chance to ask your questions to our panel of experts. If you're watching live, you can use hashtag AskAndroid, or you can use the chat function on the YouTube live stream. If you're watching the recording, sorry, too late, but you should join us live next time. Um, so without further ado, I'll ask my panel to introduce themselves and tell us what you work on, perhaps. Hi, everyone. My name is Francois, and I lead the engineering team responsible for the Android Media Framework. So that includes uh, the audio, video, and DRM area. I'm Florina Montanesco. I'm an engineer in the developer relations team working on Compose. I'm Adarsh Fernando. I'm a product manager on Android Studio. Hi, I'm Meet. I work in the Jetpack team. I'm Diana. I'm a product manager for our developer experience on Android large screens, so foldables and tablets. All right. And I'm Dan, and I'm an engineer on our developer relations team for the platform. Okay, so without any further ado, let's jump right to your first question. And it comes in from Pcodes Dev, who asks, what is the future of Jetpack Compose? Are there any plans to make it multi-platform like Flutter is today? And what are the major companies currently using Jetpack Compose for massive application development? I can try taking these three questions. Uh, so Jetpack Compose, I think it's the present and future of um, Android UI. So we're going to continue building um, uh, building the APIs. Actually, in general, on uh, we have the roadmap for, uh, for Compose available on our developer.android.com website. For the second question about uh, multi-platform. Uh, so for now, we are focused on making Compose the best it can be for Android. At the same time, we are um, aware and appreciate the fact that you know, Compose, like a lot of the things that uh, we in Android do, is open source. So this means that other companies or other people out there can build on top of the things that we create. So that's why you know we can see the 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 things that JetBrains, sorry, mm -hmm. um, is doing for Compose on desktop and iOS and more. And the third question, there was a third part of this. Big apps using. Oh yeah, big apps. Um, Oh, actually, we have a lot of these. So I think you, you've just seen the, right. the Threads uh, app. Uh, what do we have? Dropbox, Airbnb, Reddit. There's another Reddit uh, case study coming out today as well. Uh, when it comes to internal, we have uh, or internalizing like Google <laughs> apps. Uh, the Play Store is using uh, is using Compose, and we've seen other apps either uh, preparing to use Compose and yeah. Uh, so we're going to see hopefully even more in the future. Also, in general, if you're interested more about like seeing what other companies are using Compose and how they've been taking advantage of Compose in their apps, developer.android.com is your place to go. We have several case studies showing these things. Cool. 
Um, next question coming in from Jay Pazos, uh, saying at the re reply samples, this is one of our sample apps, there's a lot of code to adapt it for multiple screen size. Is there some resources to make this easier? Uh, maybe can I start taking this one as well? Because <laughs> reply is a compose app, but uh, maybe afterwards you can add if there's anything. Uh, yeah, so we're, we want to make sure that um, uh, you're able to build for large screens as easy as possible. So. We've been working on uh, building adaptive uh, layouts for Compose. So you'll see uh, layouts that are helping you to build some of the common use cases, like list detail, for example. This is something that's still in progress. If you peek on AOSP, uh, on Android X, you're going to be able to find the APIs in Snapshot. Uh, but we're still working on them, so we're hoping to soon get them in alpha. Have I missed anything? Um, I think we have a lot of resources to help on developer.android.com today. Uh, but I think you got most of it. You know, we're trying to meet developers wherever they're at. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you are a multi-activity library, we've got, you know, uh, activity embedding to help. Um, and with Compose, we're still trying to make many, many enhancements to make it easier and more out of the box for developers. Um, we've even seen with Threads, for example, that uh, their estimates for, for large screen development were actually quite um, quite simple for them to get out of large screens or letterboxing and add in landscape and portrait support. <coughs> Thanks. Uh, maybe we can go to our next question, uh, where Spaghetti Code asked, what's next for Studio Bot? Cool, I'll take that one. Um, this is definitely uh, an exciting space, um, and it is experimental. Uh, as we saw in the segment a little earlier today, we are, we've launched to 170 territories, and so we, we're focusing on bringing that to even more developers. But we also need to make sure that we're focusing on making sure the, the responses are accurate and helpful um, and so that's where we're really focusing on, and especially with the, the chat bot surface that we, we've had at launch and the new launched um, AI code completion uh, that we just uh, announced today. Uh, so just, yeah, really focusing on making sure it becomes a really dependable, reliable, assistive technology. So best thing we can ask is for people to try it out mm -hmm. and give us feedback. And of course, we showed some of the new features rolling out today, right? It's like the code completions yeah. and the new ignore files and so on. So really cool. Um, next question comes in from Annie Giff. Annie Giff, I don't know. Uh, what's the plans for Compose for TV? We would love to use it in production as standard Compose on great for focus handling. Interesting, uh, but we need to get it out of alpha first. Can I try answering this? Yeah. Um, yay for wanting to use Compose for TV. I think this is great. Um, we are working on making sure that we're nailing all of the use cases for Compose for TV until we actually get to beta. So uh, you'll see that a lot of the components are already available, but we want to make sure that you know, we're providing the, the best APIs and the base, best implementations we can for Compose for TV use cases before it's in beta. Uh, but still saying that, do check out also our resources on Compose for TV. Uh, we have samples, we have documentation, so and we're going to update these whenever the APIs go stable. Mm -hmm. When it's ready, I guess is, is the real answer. We, <laughs> we want it to be good. Soon. OK. Uh, I'm going to pull the hard questions now for you, Adash. So uh, any plans to replace Gradle with the Bazel build system? No. <laughs> but thank you for the question. <laughs> Do you want to expand on that? Or? <laughs> no, not really. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we, we get this uh, question a lot, and we, we definitely hear uh, developers. We understand uh, where, where a lot of this is coming from. Um, but definitely, we want to focus on the Gradle build system, really closing that gap mm -hmm. uh, and making sure all the things that folks want out of the Gradle build system to close that gap with uh, Bazel we're working on. So, but thanks for the question. OK. Uh, next question, more compose. Uh, is Material Free Scaffold going stable anytime soon? This is something I can take as well. Yeah. Um, if I remember right, I think Scaffold has been stable since, I think, February this year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but maybe we can talk a little bit more about, in general, about experimental APIs. So in Compose, we're trying to make sure that we're graduating APIs from experimental as soon as possible. But at the same time, we want to make sure that those APIs actually 
are stable and they're not going to change anytime soon. So, you know, like I know that um, some of the material APIs have been in experimental for a while because we're waiting for, we want to make sure that we get all the feedback we need to build those strong APIs. Or because we know that maybe there are some changes coming up in different powers of Compose, like in Foundation, that might influence the shape of the APIs uh, in Material 3. So yeah, but um, this is something that the engineering team is looking at and trying to make sure regularly that uh, we can graduate uh, as many of the APIs from experimental. And we have heard the feedback about trying not to be in experimental for too long, right? Like we had animated content in experimental for a long time because we knew we wanted to change the API at some point. So we've been trying to not leave them in experimental for so long, but we're aware. Uh, okay, next question maybe. When are we going to see the HDR plugin on the Pixel 6 Pro cameras as it was marketed? Anyone? I'm going to look at you. Yeah, well. I'm not sure what the question means by the HDR plugin. So I'm, um I, mean, I hoped you would. Yeah, I had, I had the same thought too. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what that's uh, What's referring to. HDR plugin. Yeah. I mean, we do you know the Pixel Six Pro camera supports um, HDR photography, like 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 all of our Pixels have supported for a long time. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm not sure exactly what we mean by the plugin. Okay, maybe we can move on then. Um, next question comes in from YouTube. When will the emulator stability be improved? Apps not responding issues and new apps sometimes get removed when restarting the emulator. Question emulators. Yeah, I, I can take that. Um, yeah, the em emulator is, you know, it, it really serves as a, an easy way for developers to access a wide range of uh, devices. And we, we've, to we've definitely heard the feedback that it's not uh, meeting expectations when it comes to performance and reliability. Uh, I can say that the emulator team is taking this very seriously and really focusing on uh, improving the quality and making sure that it can run on a wide ver a range of uh, workstations for different kinds of scenarios. Um, so yeah, we're definitely hearing the, the feedback and the emulator team is definitely focused on improving that quality and reliability. Cool. Uh, next question comes in from Chris. What's going on with predictive back? It's still a developer setting in Android 14. So I, I can, oh, do you want to take this one? Actually, go ahead if, if you. Yeah, no, the, the only thing I was going to say is, you know, so in Android 14, we added new predictive back animations for cross activity and cross task. And I think we're still refining all of that uh, before it actually becomes like a, uh, a regular turned on setting. Do you have something to add? Yeah, so the, the latest activity version in Jetpack does have all the integration with it. I think we finished the integration with navigation too, and then just trying to finish it navigation compose. So hopefully all you need to do is just like update your libraries and you will be ready for it unless you have like really custom implementations. And as Dan mentioned, it's a major change. So we're trying to figure out how do we roll this out without causing disruption on existing apps. So it might take a while, but hopefully you don't need to do too much to take advantage of it. Cool. Updating is very easy, I heard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Change a number and recompile. Apparently so. Uh, next question is, is device streaming only for Pixel devices? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so I think when we launched device streaming, we focused on Pixels because, I mean, that's the, the device that we could have a large, uh, we had access to a large quantity of devices. Uh, you might have seen TJ had an amazing demo earlier today, and you might have missed it, but we have added a large number of other OEM devices, including Samsung, um, uh, Xiaomi, uh, Motorola, across a wide number of API levels, I believe like 27 up to 34. Mm -hmm. So we do see that a large part of the value of device streaming is getting access to these OEM devices that are otherwise difficult or don't have you know, virtual device alternatives for. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we are focused on bringing more of those uh, devices over time. We also want to make sure that when we add devices, they are stable and reliable. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, please look forward to that. And please join the, the program. You just got to go to g.co slash Android slash device streaming. Register today. Thank you. Is it, it runs on top of the same infrastructure that powers FTL, Firebase Test Lab, right? That's right. Which it's has the a exact same lab. So the dream is that you, know, you run your tests on Firebase Test Lab across these OEMs. Mm -hmm. If there is a test failure, right from Android Studio, you can connect to mm -hmm. that exact same device mm -hmm. and manually uh, investigate, debug the issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also like repro issues, right? So if you get That's this right. one crash on rando device, you want to be able to try and repro exactly. it. Exactly. Like if you see a, a crash lytics report mm -hmm. that happens on a specific device, yeah. um, cool. hopefully you can find it on Firebase. And you can find that in the AQI tab, I'm sure. <laughs> OK, um, Angie asks, uh, are there any plans to support screenshot tests for views? Yes, Boy, I'm popular today. 
Um, no, this is a great question. So uh, I, the, the team really... Uh, Compose, I mean, as we talked about before, like Compose is the future of uh, uh, modern UI development in, uh, in Android. And so we really wanted to move the community forward. Uh, and particularly, as we talked before, previews provided just a great foundation to convert a lot of the, the same mechanisms you use today to uh, manually validate your app uh, to build easy automated tests that run very quickly host side. Um, so yeah, I think we're, we're going to be focused on Compose as, as the path forward for screenshot tests. Cool. I wonder if you could build something where you have a compose that wraps a view in order to leverage it. We, we are experimenting with that too, because we also understand that you know, there's a lot of developers who are transitioning mm -hmm. from views to compose, and how could they leverage this to make sure that as a uh, transition, they're you know, keeping within their design specs. Mm -hmm. And so could screenshot testing help with that? As a migration path. That's right. That's really nice. Cool. Like one one conflict we have in this thing is like screenshot tests run on your desktop machine, which is like very very faster. Because when we were doing compose, we always had this in mind. Versus views are like notoriously hard, very hard to run on your like operating system. Mm -hmm. So there is like this fundamental problem: like, do we go for the future that's like much nicer, and how much of the past we keep supporting? So it's, it's just not a very easy balance for us to mm -hmm. like make everything work all the time. So true. Um, maybe we could switch to the next question. So Ben asks, um, stability in Compose makes everything complicated. I hate having to use Kotlin immutable collections. Is there anything you're planning to do here? Mm -hmm. um, so to explain in uh, two sentences what stability is. So um, in Compose, if a composable's input doesn't change, then Compose will, uh, is going to skip recomposing that, uh, uh, that composable. So this is called a skipping mode. Just that this skipping logic is only generated for uh, parameters that are stable. So because of that, you end up with, or we end up with a lot of like add stable or um, parameters or like Ben here uh, was, it was mentioning using the Kotlin uh, collections just to enforce that stability. Um, we are working on changing this. So uh, we're going to... Uh, we're going to implement a mode where we're going to do this kind of like, or generate that uh, skippability check also for parameters that are not stable. This is something that we're still working on. We're aware that this is a, a really, really big change for performance. So we're not rushing into making this uh, public uh, very quickly. So in Compose 1.6, this is going to be off by default. And then we'll see how things work, how what side effects we get, and we're hoping that this can be turned on uh, towards Compose 1.7. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe next year in one of the next bombs. Yeah, yeah. watch out for more on strong skipping. Um, next up, Akshay asks, how is the Ultra HDR image feature introduced in Android 14 different from Camera HDR Plus feature present in many existing premium devices? Yeah, I, I can take this one. Um, so it's a good question because as we saw in the previous question, HDR is a term that can be used in different contexts and have different meanings. Um, uh, the HDR plus um, feature that already exists in cameras, it typically refers to like a, some type of um, exposure, exposure bracket um, solutions to uh, capture high dynamic uh, scenes. But when it's saved to uh, the file, then it's mapped to a standard 8-bit SDR um, um, image. Uh, so the, the result is that when it's uh, displayed on, on a device, even if the device supports HDR, then it still renders in, in SDR. With a new ultra HDR uh, feature that we introduced in Android 14, then it's a new format that can actually ca um, save the file directly in 10-bit. And um, so then on, on devices that support uh, HDR, uh, then the, 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 the image will be rendered in, in its full HDR display. Uh, and the beauty of that is it also the file, the format is backward compatible. So for any device or app that does not understand Ultra HDR, then it will look just like a standard 8-bit um, JPEG. Cool. Uh, next question comes in from Arthur on YouTube. Can you rewrite the UI in Kotlin and everything else in Java? I'm going to take it. Sh sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you would do that, but yeah, you can do that. Mm -hmm. So I guess it means like uh, for Compose UI specifically, yeah, I right, I'm assuming here that we don't really offer an API because it is actually a compiler plugin, which is only enabled by the Kotlin compiler. So you have to use Kotlin, right? 
But yeah, if you want to keep on writing Java for your business logic, then yeah. the strong interoperability yeah. between Java and, Compo and Kotlin is your friend. Yeah, I think we're like replacing XML with Kotlin uh -huh. and then keeping your Java code. No. Uh, yeah, we'd love to hear problem, like why, because we think Kotlin is, is the future yeah. and we kind of want to invest more. I mean, Compose is our biggest yeah. um, bet, I guess you could say, in a Kotlin only um, world. But so if you want to keep on writing Java, we'd love to hear, you know, is that? Yeah, I, I, think, I think things like coroutines are just so useful that, you know, and, and that's where you start to really see a huge advantage when you start having those uh, go into your business logic as well. Actually, that's a very good point. Compose heavily relies on coroutines, which you cannot use from Java. So it will be really hard to uh, merge your compose code with your Java code in certain cases. Mm -hmm. So that might be like you may need to some write some intermediate additional Kotlin code to bind them to your Java world. But again, I don't know why would anyone wants to do this. I think if we're talking about a migration case where you have a, a bigger bigger app that is still in Java. And yes, you can indeed move your, uh, start rewriting your UI or writing the new UI in uh, in Kotlin. Uh, but yeah, as as we said, indeed, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of also coroutine knowledge that is needed for when you write Compose. So like think about some of the side effects and so on that require deeper coroutine knowledge. But then also I'm hoping that once you gain that knowledge, you also realize how nice it is to use and as you touch some other parts of your app that are still in java you convert them to kotlin what is it the fred's uh, video said that they get a visceral reaction of you code now yeah. I, I can identify that um maybe we can move on um interesting question what is google doing in regards to security on android Apparently, malware is getting out of hand um, i'm not sure we can like really talk about the malware, but I know that Android 14 is doing a lot of things around security, so maybe we could. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that you know that that uh, I mostly you know our, our our focus on security has just been to uh, uh, you know close any gaps that we've seen, and I think I think you've seen that uh, you know again you see more and more APIs are being locked down, more and more uh, uh, you you just you just look at our our list of security. Um, uh, patches that, that that we put on to developer.android.com, you can see each one of those security updates and all the work that's been going on there. So, um, so yes, uh, there there were a bunch of specific changes in Android 14 around security, but I, I think in general that's uh, uh, that's something we work on also with the Play Store. So you know the combination of what Play does and what an and what the platform does uh, really tries to lock down the malware story. Okay, uh, next up, Sarah asks: uh, um, Building media experiences on Android is much more difficult and time-consuming than on iOS, especially with the wide variety of device capabilities. What is your recommendation to make it easier for devs? Yep. Um, so, yeah, we fully acknowledge that uh, building media experience on Android has, has been uh, quite difficult. Um, I think it's it's um, there's two reasons for that. The one is that a lot of the APIs that we have in the in the SDK, they're low-level APIs, uh, like media codec, um, so more difficult to use or require specific media expertise from, um, for, from the app developers. But also uh, because the underlying uh, codecs are provided by the chipset, which uh, uh, can have different capabilities and also uh, different behaviors. Um, so the in order to address that, we've uh, built a Jetpack Media 3. Uh, the idea of Jetpack Media 3 is that it's a home for all the uh, the high-level APIs for app developers to use. So that's the home also for ExoPlayer now, but also for all the new uh, capabilities that we uh, provide, like especially around uh, content creation, like transcoding, handling HDR, or everything around video editing. Um, uh, the idea of Media 3 is that it's easier to use. So if you if developers only need a, a, a simple or, or, or common use cases, they don't require any media expertise. And yet it's easy to customize by injecting custom components uh, for advanced use cases. That's one part. And the other part is that uh, Media 3 also uh, encapsulates, I try to abstract as much as possible, the device fragmentation mm -hmm. by um, uh, handling all the device-specific capability uh, differences uh, either it's, uh, it's either workarounds for devices that have limitations, or even like take advantage of specific capabilities that uh, that certain uh, hardware have. Similar to Camera X, where we try and encapsulate all the quirks of different devices, That's right. so you don't have to. Cool. Next question comes from Andrew. How can I tell if a device is a foldable or a tablet, or should I? Uh, I'm going to answer that with another question, which is Andrew. Why do you need to know? Uh, <laughs> um, 
I, I think generally, so we do have stuff that will help you figure out if there's a foldable or a tablet, but generally we recommend that you should really be treating them the same. Uh, for the most part, developers are looking to understand how should they adapt their layouts. And one of the pitfalls of trying to condition a layout on if there's a foldable or a tablet is, you know, sometimes they have the generally the same screen size, right? And if you, you know, uh, if you look at the tablet that Nick's got in his hand, right, if he were to put an app in a s split screen, then that app is essentially the same size as it would be on a foldable. Um, so we generally advocate that if you're trying to do this for layouts, you should use window size classes. Um, if you need to know for another reason, like you're trying to figure out if you're on a uh, phone with a SIM or a device with a SIM, we have other APIs for that too. Um, and I think back in May, we actually published a blog on, you know, four different use cases. Here's probably the APIs that you need. At the same time, if you are looking, there's a hinge API, so you can detect if there's a hinge. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of gives different, different solutions. But generally we say, use window size classes and build a fully adaptive app. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think it's such a like continuous variety of screen sizes. It's very hard to like, you know, only say I only support this one. It's like, yeah. Yeah, I think it, design. if you can move to adaptive design, ultimately that significantly reduces the amount of test mm. costs that you have. Um, and you're not going to have to go and buy a foldable or buy a tablet. I mean, you, in all practicality, you probably will mm -hmm. um, do some sort of device streaming onto these devices. Look at that. Look at that. Um, but... <laughs> uh, but once you build an adaptive app, I think that makes it easier for you to maintain the right UI across devices. Cool. Uh, next question comes from Joe, who asks about foreground services and says they're critical for extended computations, such as transcoding. But it looks like only a few types are supported. What should I do? Well, I think, you know, first of all, when you talk about the foreground services changes that we made in uh, Android 14, it really was about trying to bring the ecosystem together and trying to get consistent behavior across uh, the vast majority of devices we have in the ecosystem. And I, I think that um, for something like transcoding specifically, um, that's the kind of thing that unless it really needs to be done right now in front of the user, it probably could be done in a job. You have 10 minutes, so that's, that's a really long time. If you do need longer than 10 minutes, we do offer some affordances for both uh, specific use cases. Um, you know, we still do have data sync, for example, um, and as well as um, you can actually offer, ask for a special affordance from Play. There's something that's absolutely critical to your use case. Um, but, um, but right now, the way as, it, as it's constructed, hopefully most of that stuff can be done uh, in a, inside of a job. Uh, do you want to uh, elaborate on this one? Uh, yeah, most uh, we're also working on, so we try to distinguish between the things that user wanted to do, which we call yeah. user-initiated jobs. And uh, like if the user wanted to do something, now we have uh, like a new, new type of jobs for that they look like foreground services that they were capable. Uh, so we want to move the ecosystem towards that eventually, but we understand that with backwards compatibility, that's not that straightforward. So we have been working on a Jetpack library, just very specific to the use case that will implement some best of our backwards compatibility for you. I don't know when it will be ready. We are still working on it. So maybe like say early next year, maybe we can have something. Uh, but yeah, we, we understand this is a transition and we're taking this very seriously. Like we look at every mm -hmm. single use case we can find, talk to the apps, developers, it, apps inside Google to find like what are the things we need to support so that we can support all the cases that needs to be supported and also prevent all the other bad actors that have been uh, using foreground services mm -hmm. to do things that are not necessarily good. Will that be in services. Web Manager or is it separate? Uh, it, uh, I think it will be a combination. We're still trying to figure out because uh, the, the fundamental thing about Work Managers is a deferrable bird mm -hmm. by design, like something you can defer. Versus user initiated is the opposite of it. Like I want to do this in the background, but like user wanted me to do this. Yeah. Uh, but in the backwards compatibility story, we are still figuring out do we want to use the foreground services or do we want to use work manager? And that's, that's the difficult design decision. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's taking a while. Cool. Uh, next question comes in saying, is Compose Navigation going to have a UI editor support like the navigation component for fragments? So Adash is the studio of PM, and he's like, you take this question. <laughs> <laughs> that's so I can promise on his behalf that it will have <laughs> 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 no, uh, we are uh, actually for for Compose navigation. Like when when the Compose was being built, we were like, okay, we need to find a really nice like transition path so apps using navigation can move to Compose, keep most of their existing code, these two working together, and 
That's very difficult. That's, that's the part we went. And now we are thinking about, okay, since Compose has been gaining out of adoption, I don't know at what percentage we are, but it's growing very fast. So, okay, like what if we start thinking about a Compose only world or Compose first world? Mm -hmm. And like what would a navigation solution would look like? And we don't know where that will go, but that's, that's where we are right now. And while doing such a, like a large consideration, then it's like part of it is the tools team. Paris is like part of that effort trying to figure out, okay, how do we make this toolable? Uh, so Adash said yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like I've been challenged to say something now, but um, yeah, we definitely see that this is a, a, you know, a gap from what we provided in, in views. Uh, for views, but really our the focus for the tools team right now is really helping developers get the most performance wise out of compose as well as really accelerating the iteration flow of like uh, making changes previewing them using live edit to also uh, iterate on your code and so really that's kind of our focus but yeah this is on our radar to kind of uh, a gap to close in the future. Cool. I think we've got time for a couple more. Um, is Jetpack Media Free going to get a Compose UI artifact in the future, or do we really need to keep using the interop with Android View and Player View? That's, uh, can I start answering uh, this? Uh, and then, uh, thank you. <laughs> this is a great question. That's, um, I think that's something that we've been thinking of as well. Um, we are aware that using the interop isn't the best solution, so we're trying now to figure out, okay, what is the, the ideal solution? Uh, so. Hopefully, at one point. Do you want to build? Yeah, uh, confirm. I mean, that's we we know right now it's not a good solution, and we definitely work. We actually have a uh, on, ongoing work uh, happening uh, uh, to make it easier to um, uh, leverage the um, uh, player UI that is part of Jetpack um, Media Three uh, uh, with Compose. Cool. So you heard it here. We got a promise of Compose APIs for media. I didn't mention any time frame, but uh, just saying we're working. Uh -huh. right. Okay, another question. Miko asks, is there a caveat on overusing constraint layout in Compose, everywhere in an Android app, um, and are there performance issues? Someone want to take that? I can start. Uh, I would ask, what are the, the, the use cases that uh, you're using constraint layout for, and where does the, do the regular you know, column and row uh, are not enough? Um, in terms of performance issues, I'm not sure. Are you aware well, of I think, any? yeah, constraint layout is still using multi-pass measure, if I, I believe. So I think it can be less performant. I, I could be wrong there. I forget. Um, but generally, we say like constraint layout in the view world used to give you a, a performance improvement because you could like flatten your hierarchy rather than having lots of nesting. Isn't an issue in Compose, so don't use it for that reason. More for if a design is naturally expressed using constraints to so something's relative to another thing, um, or you want to be able to move it around and swap constraint sets out, then these are the things that constraint layout does very well. So you know, still reach for it in those cases. If rows and columns work for you, then they can be simpler, so use those. So, I don't think it has to be one answer. We provide both of them to give you the options to use the right tool for depending on the job, I think. One thing I've seen so far is that developers are just so familiar with constraint layout from, uh, from Vue, so then it's the first tool they reach out to when they're building UIs in Compose. Mm -hmm. But does it need to be? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, an architecture question comes in from David, who asks, which layer do notifications belong in? I don't know. I'm <laughs> 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 obliged to answer. I mean, I, I think like it, it, it is like, I think across layers, right? Like the part of the receiving the notification is obviously is your like lower layer business logic talking to Firebase or whatever notification system you use to figure out what you want to do with that information. And then there's the UI layer of it because you want to, most of the time, I'm guessing this is talking about the user visible notifications. You want to show something that goes to the UI layer. So it's not, like, you know, kind of cuts cross and has parts depending on your use case. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's like super simple, then you don't really have any business logic, you just display it to the user. But oftentimes it's a lot more complicated than that. You do something, maybe fetch some data before you show it to the user. Mm -hmm. uh, so across the layers is the answer. That's why we have layers, right? None of the above. Each layer has <laughs> its own <laughs> concerns, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, See maybe one more, two more. Uh, I see lots of Compose hybrid apps that still use fragments for navigation and view model scoping with single Compose view. Any gotchas to look out for this? With this, uh, not really. That was like part of that like transition design. I want to want to make sure you can move to Compose without changing too much of your code. Uh, 
I don't know if he published any best practices about this, but they, like in general, there's no gacha, but we we want to eventually provide a world where you don't need to use the fragments and fragments navigation to get the same like isolation and convenience. So we're looking into that was the right approach for compose navigation. We have been working on like how to integrate with something like Hilt because it's not just about your navigation, it is your dependency ejection at one side navigation on the other side and the third wheel is like the the wheel models or where you store your transient state so the combination of these made like the frank single activity navigation really useful and i want to have the same level of support for compose It'll just take some time mm -hmm. we're working on it and I think, unfortunately, that is about our time that we have today. So thank you very much for all the questions that everyone has sent in. And thank you to our panel uh, for all of your fantastic answers and discussion. And now back over to me in New York. It's been an absolute blast hanging with you all today. We've covered so much, but I can't believe our time together is coming to a close. Today has been a real treat. Thank you all for joining us. But remember, the fun isn't over yet. We're excited to bring the Android team and Android Google developer expert friends like me to events around the world. Later this month, the Android team will be at DroidCon London, bringing talks around many exciting topics and a panel of subject matter experts. And Android GDEs like myself will be speaking at over 100 DevFest events around the world, with special appearances from the Android team at DevFest in New York, the Bay Area, London, Singapore, and more. We look forward to connecting with thousands of you in person. Across all of these, we'll be focused on your productivity as developers, making it faster and easier to build excellent premium apps across devices. You can learn more about what you saw today on developer.android.com. We'll provide the tools that feed into your productivity so you can build faster and easier your own programs with excellent apps across devices. Anise with the buzzer beater right there. It looks like we all win today. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> that was fun. Maybe we can actually explore New York now? I can use a slice of pizza. What if they do that here? Let's go.